morning and welcome to Robinson Baptist Church uh, here and at home. Um, I just uh, want to say at the beginning, we, we wish we could all be together, obviously, and uh, so we, we do miss the gathering together here in this place and look forward to when we can do that again. Um, but in the meantime, we're here to celebrate Palm Sunday, to, uh, to worship together, uh, even though we are apart and so we'll begin just with a couple family items. I uh, I wanted to uh, wanted to point out um, that uh, today is actually the 46th wedding anniversary for Ray and Leanne Jacobson. So uh, to my my mother and father-in-law, um, happy anniversary and uh, many more years, uh, Lord willing. Um, a few birthdays as well as uh, as we're not able to be together. I think it's important to at least. Uh, uh, celebrate with each other even over, over this uh, distance. Um, this past week, both Mark Aldrink and Shelley Griffhorst. And then this coming week, uh, we have uh, Byron Butendorp, uh, Jim Barker, Shirley Andre, and Lois Wiersma all celebrating birthdays. So please, uh, please, if you have a chance, if it, brings, if it comes to mind, make sure that you reach out and wish them all happy birthday, or in the case of uh, the Jacobsons, a, a happy anniversary. Um, I, I wanted to uh, thank the, uh, the Sunday School kids who had been working for a, a number of months um, in order to sing a song for you this morning, and uh, it, that did not happen. But I do want to thank all those kids who, uh, who spent uh, numerous weeks planning, uh, uh, planning that, practicing, Thank you to Cheryl for her, her assistance with that as well. Um, I am going to post a link to the, uh, to the church uh, Facebook, um, and uh, hopefully Jana can then uh, forward that on. A link to uh, what they were going to be singing, um, Lift Up Your Heads, uh, a very, uh, I think, appropriate song for Palm Sunday. Um, but uh, hopefully you will enjoy that, even though it won't be um, the Robinson kids that will be singing that. Um, well, we are here today to worship God together, uh, to sing praises to our Lord and Savior. And so where you are at home, we're going to sing, You Are My King, Amazing Love. Joy to all. 
amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know is true. It's my joy to love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to Pastor? Let's pray together. Almighty God and gracious Lord, with gratitude we appeal before you this morning with the assurance that our great God and Savior Jesus Christ is Emmanuel. He is God with us. We have the confidence that in Christ and Him alone we can grasp the person of God. In Christ and Him alone we can enjoy the presence of God. In Christ and Him alone we can know the prescriptions or the precepts of God. In Christ and in Him alone we can benefit from the promises of God. Through Him, God is our refuge. God is our strength. God is our rescue. Hence, do we thank you for your mercy and your grace, which you have faithfully manifested to others in sending your Son and in giving us all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies in him. We thank you for the faithful testimony of our beloved assembly for over 60 years as we celebrate that faithfulness this month. We thank you for the faithfulness of the believers presently in that you have kept them from falling. We thank you for the provision in weekly offerings to carry out your work here on earth. We thank you for the obvious love these believers have for each other. We thank you for supplying generously for the families among us that they may take care of themselves. Please, Lord, do not relent. Continue to make them prosperous and that in return they will serve you even more faithfully. We thank you for technology that allows us to connect even though we may not be in physical proximity. Knowing that you detain all prerogatives over this universe since it was created by you, and for you, we therefore pray the services and works which you have entrusted to us, that you would bless them. We pray for the salvation of people among us who may not yet know the bliss of your mercy and forgiveness. We pray for soundness of faith of those who are in doubt. We pray for the surrender of those who are still rebellious despite the good news of your grace, preach to them and with which you have impressed their hearts through your Holy Spirit. We pray for protection as this pandemic is uh, gaining ground. May you build an edge around our people that in then if it should be your will that for services sake, they will be infected. We pray that the testimony will be grandiose and, and profound. 
We pray, Father, for the dedication of our people to pray in this time, to pray fervently, both in frequency and also in intensity, both in frequency and fervency. We pray for courage and wisdom for them to live, to live right, that their words and their communion with each other will be bl a blessing. We pray for their commitment to serve, that these are opportunities to point people to Christ and give them hope. We pray, Lord, for the ones you have established over us in authority. Therefore, we present before you Governor Whitmer and those elevated in authority in Lansing and in our Odawa County that every one of them will be mindful that the authority they have from you, they have received it. And to your honor and glory should they dispense it. Likewise, do we pray for the president and the vice president of our beloved country. May they be gracious toward your people as Cyrus was to the people of Israel. Give them health and strength for the daily challenges. Deliver them from self-importance and pride. Provide them with insight that they could help this nation to be a beacon of light whereby your people may have a platform and the resources to spread your holy gospel around the world for the salvation of the lost. We are definitely under a big distress. And we pray, Father, that using the leaders we have, you will guide us on the right path. Where you are God who is weak and selfish, we will not be praying to you. We would try to trick you. But you detain all prerogatives over the, th over the universe which you have created. And you are merciful and gracious. Therefore, Lord, we pray that glory and honor be to you forever and ever in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. We'll continue in worship by doing our weekly reading out of the New Covenant. Uh, this week's passage will be the uh, 19th chapter of Matthew, starting in verse 1 and continuing through the entire chapter. When Jesus had finished these words, he departed from Galilee and came into the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered, then said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for immorality, and marries another woman, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. Then some children were brought to him so that he may lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not hinder them from coming to me. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. And someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I might obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. 
Then he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept, what am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, If you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. May the Lord add his blessing to, our re to the reading of his word. And now we will continue in song by singing... Be Thou My Vision, all four stanzas, followed by Before the Throne of God. No 
tongue can bid me thence depart. No tongue can bid me thence depart. When Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen Lamb, thy perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable high King of glory and of grace, one with himself I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood, my life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and my God, with Christ my Savior and Amen. Pastor. Thank you, Brother Phil. It is a joy and a pleasure to be with you, and definitely a blessing to be in a virtual house of the Lord. I will ask you at this time to open your Bible to Psalm 46. Psalm 46. And I will uh, read that psalm for you, and after a little prayer, I'll share with you what the Lord has put on my heart, both for you and for me. The psalm reads this way, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Though its waters roll and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river whose strength with streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as just at the break of dawn. The nations rage, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord, who has made desolations in the earth. He makes wars, seize to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will, exalt, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Lord, may you put your stamp of blessing and approval upon the word that as it goes forth, it will fulfill your purpose. Announce your servant in a special way that despite his own weaknesses and limitations, that the work of the Holy Spirit will be done in the hearts of people who will hear the message of our word. Magnify yourself that way, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know, if uh, Psalm 46 were a path, it will visibly be very well trodden and deeply worn. Believers who live in areas of the world where crises are a norm rather than a rarity 
constantly evoke Psalm 46. Their lips frequently repeat or sing this encouraging psalm. It is indeed him, a hymn for them, a hymn when their faith is facing fear. Both in time and space, generations after generations of believers have found comfort in this psalm. I cannot count how often when I was a pastor in Haiti, I heard believers recite this psalm. And this psalm is appropriate for us today as well. The psalm itself provides at least three guidelines to properly use it. One guideline is explicit and refers to the tone. Another guideline derives from the structure. And a third guideline pertains to the theological assumptions from which this psalm and others like it are composed. It is personalization. First, the tone. Notice that the psalm comes with a user menu right at the beginning. To the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah, a psalm for Alamoth. A psalm of the sons of Korah refers to how the psalm was composed. The sons of Korah were the established musicians whose ministry was to set the right mood among the people of God. They composed poems or selected poems, which we call psalm today. Also, they put poems to music. If the mood of the people had to be festive, they composed or used music to kindle that mood. Whether the mood were to be one of repentance or, or one of war, or a mood of deliverance, they led with the appropriate hymns. They composed this poem, this uh, Psalm 46, for a specific occasion. Most scholars believe that the occasion was the time of Hezekiah, when God gave victory to his people over Sennacherib around 701, 701 before Christ was born in 2 Kings chapter 19. So this college of composers or of musicians submitted the poem to the chief musician with clear instruction on how the tone should be set. They said it here, a song for Alamoth. That means the poem should be a hymn to be sung like a soprano would sing in a dramatic opera. The expression alamoth may be translated either by on soprano or by or for or for the choir of the virgins. Either way, the tone was to reflect the demeanor of a person who is vulnerable and who finds security in God. So here's the second guideline on how to use this psalm or hymn. It is the structure. The word sila occurs three times at the end of verses verse, uh, 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 3, at the end of verse 7, and at the end of verse 11. That word is used most often to signal a pause in the singing to allow the instruments to play and therefore for the people to meditate upon what has just been sung. So this is a song that should not be sung or repeated mindlessly. Though written for a choir to sing and for all people to repeat, it requires meditation. Each stanza has a theme. In the first stanza, the verses 1 to 3, God isolates the believer from the crisis. In the second stanza, verses 4 to 7, the believer stays in place, but God isolates the enemy away from the believer. In the third stanza, Verses 8 through 11, uh, uh, God isolates, in the third sentence, God destroys the ferocity of the enemy to protect the believer. So in each case, the believer must meditate on these truths. So the reason to meditate on these truths is because of the third guideline, personalization. The third guideline is presumed from the literary character of the psalm. Psalms like these contain absolute statements. God will deliver us. 
God is our rock. God is our refuge. Or as in verse 5, Jerusalem will not be moved. These statements apply to your personal situation if your personal situa situation meets the precondition of the premises. The small prince, so to speak. The premise to such absolute statement is this. Everything being normal, what is stated applies to you. Let me make a common proverb, uh, take a common proverb in English as an illustration. Beauty is in the eye of the believer. So the proverb means that judging beauty is never objective. The, the same thing that one person may find beautiful is found by another person not to be beautiful. Now, does that mean that no two people ever agree on whether something is beautiful or not? No. But it does mean that all things being normal, this is true. That beauty is in the eye of the, of the believer, of the beholder. So if we were to use grammar, we will call it exceptions to the rule. So likewise, the same premise predicates the absolute statement to this, to this psalm. When we come to verses 4 and 5, I will explain the factors by which to judge whether this promise applies to you or not. Albeit this psalm is a hymn of faith facing fear. This is the hymn that faith sings when faith is facing a clear and present danger. Throughout the centuries, pastors and missionaries, preachers, and especially regular believers have used this psalm when their faith is facing fearful circumstances. One such instance has occurred in the 1500s. From February through April of 1521, representatives from the Emperor of Germany and some a few religious leaders tried to negotiate with Martin Luther to persuade him to accept the theology of the Roman Church. Luther declined on principles that he could not violate scripture or his conscience. When word reached the Pope that Luther had declined the negotiations, the Pope issued an, issued an edict on May 8, 1521, he put a ban on Luther. That was a sort of social distancing, except that this ban on Luther was a death warrant. According to the ban, no one was to be hospitable to Luther or feed him or, or help him or conduct any transaction with him in any way. And if found, Luther was to be arrested and delivered to the emperor. The Lord actually protected Luther, and Luther died a natural death 25 years later, in 1546. But throughout these 25 years, there were many instances where Luther was discouraged. This man who so valiantly stood for the faith against both the Pope and the Emperor, this man went through periods of discouragement when his faith faced fear. It is reported that in many occasions, he called his closest associate, Philip Melanchthon, and said, Philip, let us sing Psalm 46. And this psalm was such a companion to him in these times of trouble that he used it as an inspiration to compose a hymn. In other words, he personalized the psalm in this hymn. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. And though his, this world with demons filled shall threaten to undo us, we will not fear. Do you hear this? We will not fear, for God has willed his truth to triumph through us. Luther personalized this song. In fact, in religious literature, it is commonly nicknamed the Psalm of Luther. You could personalize this psalm as well, this hymn of faith.
facing fear as well. So let's see how. Let me begin, friend, by telling you that if you rely upon the comfort of this psalm, you must believe, as verses 1 to 3 declare, that God in his providence is your savior or deliverer. Deliverance for the one facing a humanly invincible foe cannot come from a formula or from stratagem or from other human beings or from oneself. According to this psalm, it is not a what that saves us, it is a who. That is why the testimony in verse 1 is so encouraging. God, not a formula, not a stratagem, not other human beings, not one's own efforts and resources. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You know, these three metaphors, refuge, strength, and help, they encompass all the potential angles of help that the believer would need. And you can see as we look at those three, the first one is telling us that God is your refuge against overwhelming troubles. A refuge isolates you from the danger. When a tornado hits, you do not combat the tornado, you take refuge. You go to the most secure place where you can isolate yourself, where you can be out of reach to the tornado. You see, God is the refuge for those circumstances of life that are overwhelming and overpowering like a tornado. It is also said in verse 1 that God is our strength. It is that God is your strength or your support against crushing troubles. Some circumstances require a Savior who is our stronghold. In those, God is your refuge. In other circumstances, you need a Savior who is your strength. The one who is fleeing away from trouble needs a refuge. The one who is weak under the weight of a trouble needs strength to endure or to withstand. When the danger is overwhelming and external, God is our refuge. When the danger is crushing and internal, God is the strength. You see, the image is that of a cane or a staff or a rock upon which you lean so that you might not fall. But that verse 1 also tells us that God is your rescue out of invasive troubles. When the trouble is both internal and external, when there is no place to hide and no capacity to even lean on God, then God is an excellent rescuer out of clear and present danger. He isolates from danger as your refuge. He strengthens amidst danger as your strength. He rescues from danger as your help or your rescue. That's a very encouraging testimony from people who have experienced God as their refuge, as their strength, and as their help. But if you look, that verse 1 also tells us something further that this testimony is also validated. They are not just words. The believers who testify of God as refuge, strength, and help maintain strongly that it worked that way for them. He says it's a very present help. The psalmist points that God can be validated by experience. So let's say you have an ailment. Nobody can find a cure, and a particular medicine healed 100 people who are close to you and who had the same ailment. You would trust that medicine, wouldn't you? Likewise, the declaration in Psalm 46 is not a hypothesis, but testimonials for many people who have experienced God. God is for us. The testimonials accentuate two characteristics about the God who, who provides. And you see those two things that that verse characterizes is that God is always excellent 
as a refuge, as strength, and as a rescue. He does the job. God has been found to be the definitive solution, the de definitive cure to any distress. And the second thing that those believers, believers validate is not only that God is always excellent as be, at being a refuge, a strength, and a, re, and, a, a re, and, and a rescue, he is also always available. You see, he is always present when deliverance is needed. A very present help. If someone does not receive rescue from him, it is neither because God is not capable not because he is not available. It is because the person in distress is in refusal. God has been proven through the centuries in time and space to be the right antidote to trouble. If the trouble be overwhelming, he is a refuge. If the trouble be crushing, he is the strength. If the trouble be invasive, he is the rescue. Matthew chapter 9 uh, and my, Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8 tells the story of a woman who suffered a hemorrhage for 12 years. The hemorrhage was an internal weakness. Mark tells us she was also in trouble externally. She had suffered, Mark says, many things for many physicians. These people who bore the badge advertising that they were the professional rescuers, Yet they were the ones who abused her. Perhaps the abuse was both physical and financial. And she was in a society that was not supportive of her. Distress internally, distress externally, distress invasively. The impressive point of the story is not only the very present help she received in the day of her distress, but how easy it was for God to rescue her from her overwhelming, crushing, and invasive distress. Convinced that only God could rescue her, she came from behind, touched the Lord's garment. Not the Lord himself, not an embrace, not jumping on Jesus and both feet lifted and saying something like this, God is my refuge and my strength. And a very, he, no, he did not. Immediately as she touched the garment, she said, Mark said, immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. Wouldn't you call that a very present help in trouble? Imagine that woman standing up year after year and giving her testimony and saying something like this, God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. Let me tell you the story. Now, wouldn't you seek that same excellent and available refuge and strength and help? These psalmists gathered together and wrote this testimony to encapsulate who God has been to Israel and who God is to those who trust in him. He is refuge, strength, and rescue in whatever type of distress. Jesus said to the woman, Daughter, your faith, your faith has made you well. Not you're touching the garment or, or you're coming from behind or any such thing. Your faith. And like, likewise, the psalmist after the solemn declaration in verse 1, express faith for whatever may come in the future. If you look at it in verses 2 and 3, from the testimony of believers that is both encouraging and validated, the third thing, they now express a confident expectation. The Bible says, therefore, in verse 2, therefore, we will not fear. That is a way to say we will resort to the same refuge, the same strength, the same rescue, whatever be tied in the future. God got this. Look at verse 2 and 3 to see the random, not all-inclusive, 
but the random list of potential future distresses which they mention. They are natural disasters. The list is by representation all-inclusive. So whatever, whatever natural disaster, God is still the trusty deliverer. All inclusivity and also all intensity. Here in verses 2 and 3, they speak in hyperbole to express the confidence they have set in their hearts to face the most extreme disasters imaginable or unimaginable. No fear when the whole earth is removed or preferentially when the whole earth is in turmoil or tormented, when there seems to be no escape anywhere in the world, no fear, only faith. They say they will have no fear if the usual and most secure places of refuge, like the mountains, were to be removed, were to be moved and propelled to the sea. No fear, faith. No fear even if waters were to roll like a tsunami that would engulf everything. No fear. Faith. No fear even if the mountains could crack and not provide adequate barrier against the waters of a tsunami. No fear. But faith. When everything is unreliable, someone to whom God has been a refuge and strength and rescue maintains an unmovable faith. Sila. At this point, the voices stop, the instruments play, so that everyone would meditate and personalize the truth that was just sung. And as we come to verses 4 to 7, when the voices return, what those voices are telling us is this, friend, if you rely upon the comfort of this psalm, you must acknowledge, just as verses 4 to 7 do, that God, by his presence, is your protector. The psalmist turned from testimonials in verses 1 to 3 to evidence in verses 4 to 7. They turn from the testimonies of the individuals who express faith in God to the institution God has established, the temple. They turn from the people who exercise faith to the city that should be the embodiment of faith, Jerusalem. Let me read the passage for you. He says, there is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her just as at the break of dawn. The nations rage. The kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. During the time that Sennacherib besieged Jerusalem, Hezekiah had engineered underground channels, uh, channels to allow water to enter the city. And worship did not cease. In fact, worship increased as it should be in this time of social distancing as well for us. A victorious sense of gladness, a triumphant sense of joy still resided, as verse 4 said, in the holy place of the temple of the Mount of the Most High. The people, in spite of the siege, had confidence that God could be, would be their refuge, and only God could be that. If indeed the psalm was written in the occasion of the victory of uh, God gave to his people over Sennacherib, there is indeed historical evidence to support the claims in, verses, in these verses. Despite this resemblance between what the psalmists have written in Psalm 46 and the story of Hezekiah, I do not have enough to verify and to prove that this psalm was actually written in that time. But let's say that it was not. The story of Ezekiah will still serve us as an illustration, evidence that God is indeed that kind of God who takes off of his people. Ezekiah had said to the people, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. That's what Ezekiah said by faith. 
Sennacherib, however, though through his general who stood in the proximity of the, ten, of the wall of Jerusalem, so through that general, the general spoke loudly and in Hebrew so that all the people will understand. And the general mocked the faith of Hezekiah. And God gave Hezekiah an astounding victory. Though Hezekiah's army was the underdog, and he had victory over the superpower army of Sennacherib. Figuratively, friends, Robinson Baptist Church is our Jerusalem. Figuratively, it is our temple. And I can confidently say that God will protect us the same. I can confidently say so, yet with two caveats. You see, the psalmist said in verse 5 that Jerusalem, the holy place, shall not be moved. That is an absolute statement, isn't it? And actually, Jerusalem was moved in 605 B.C. The people of God went to captivity at Babylon. Both the temple and the city were utterly destroyed. So I told you at the beginning that this absolute declaration presumes a premise that conditions their personal application. The premise is this. All things being normal, this statement applies to you. So what are the preconditions, the small prints, so to speak, the abnormal things that may render this promise, this hymn of faith facing fear, somewhat somewhat void. Throughout the history of faith and throughout scripture, there are two exceptions that may circumvent the fulfillment of God's promises. There are issues pertaining either to sanctification or to service. So let's look at the first. First, personalizing this promise depends upon issues pertaining to sanctifications. Issues pertaining to sanctification may nullify God's promise. Sin nullify promises even for the believer. Isaiah stated it very clearly to the people of God in his time when he said in Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, Behold, the Lord's head is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. The Lord Jesus declared the same to those of his day who sought religious performance without genuine repentance from sin. He, he said that, at the day of judgment, the promise of salvation will not apply to them. Christ said this in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21-23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast our demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Sin nullifies God's promise to be your refuge, your strength, and your rescue. Sin is the greatest disaster that a person can face. It is the greatest distress. But in Christ Jesus, sin has been defeated. And God can be, if you repent and trust in Christ, God can be your refuge, your strength, and your rescue from sin, whatever sin it may be, and whatever its intensity. Friend, if you do not know Jesus as your Savior, or if you are just performing religion, with our genuine repentance, why would you do such a thing? It is disastrous, and that for eternity. 
You saw how easy it was for that woman to be healed from the 12 year hemorrhage. Well, it is that easy for God to forgive you of your sin when you stretch out to repent. John tells us how easy it is in, chapter, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. He says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness, whatever it may be, in number or in intensity. So don't wait. Do it right now. And I can tell you that I have benefited from that promise over and over and over in my own life. Take this deal, friend. Confess your sins so that you might be eligible to God's promises. Issues of sanctification may nullify God's promise. Yes, there is a second caveat to this hymn of faith facing fear. Issues pertaining to service may neutralize God's promise. In issuing the stay-at-home orders, the authorities around the country have uh, put exceptions. They say, except for essential personnel. Soldiers, likewise, are not afforded the same security as civilians. The wall of a president to protect and defend Americans includes being commander-in-chief to put American soldiers at risk in battle. Likewise, while God promises to be refuge, strength, and rescue to his people, while he promises that, he may at times exempt his essential personnel from some aspects of that promise. He may sometimes use any of, of us as soldiers facing greater risk and harm. In fact, Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us of that in verses 33 to 39. Look at this. He says, there were some who through faith subdued kingdom, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lion, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead, raised to life again. And by the same breath, in the middle of verse 35, the verse says, others, by contrast, were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sown in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these having obtained a good testimony through faith, you hear this? All these having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. While God promises to protect his people against harm, he also selects them to be essential personnel in various circumstances. The interesting thing is that any one of us, not the pastor only or the deacons, any one of us in a variety of innumerable circumstances can be that essential personnel for that specific circumstance. Some may serve through illness. Some may serve through healing. Some may serve through financial successes. Some may serve through financial hardship. Any one of us. That is why Peter gives us the exhortation, therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God. You hear this? Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good while they are suffering as to a faithful creator. If you are suffering according to the will of God, it's because of service. Sin 
nullifies God's promise. Service may neutralize certain aspects of it. And if because of service you have to endure distress, my brother or my sister, commit yourself to God, says Peter, in doing a service as unto a faithful creator who is in control of all things. He is not going to be unfaithful while you are using, he is using you on the front line. Just like the commander-in-chief of a country will not abandon his army. These caveats granted, the psalmist assures us of the normal way that God protects his own by declaring in verse 7, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. 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 Then the voices stop again. The music plays so that we might meditate and personalize, personalize this to, our, to ourselves. Taking into account where the sin might nullify this promise for you, or where the service might neutralize some aspect of it. So we come to the third and last stanza. You see, God in his providence is our deliverer. Yes, in his, uh, by his presence, but in, by his providence, he is our deliverer. In, by his presence, he is our protector, unless sin were to nullify the promise of his protection or service were to neutralize certain aspects of his protection. There is more, friend. If you rely upon the comfort of this psalm, you must ascertain, as verses 8 to 11 admonish, that God, through his intervention, God, through his intervention, is your defender. In verses 1 to 3, God isolates us from the distress. In verses 4 to 7, we stay in place like a city. God isolates the distress away from us. In verses 8 to 11, God destroys the distress altogether to defend us. You see, verses 8 and 9 are telling us that no distress can withstand God's might. In verses 2 and 3, the psalmist spoke in hyperbole to give examples of distresses that will render them unafraid because God is their refuge, strength, and rescue. Now in verses 8 and 9, the psalmist speak by analogy to illustrate how God can beat the enemy and defend his own. They say that God can utterly destroy the land and make it as desolate as a desert, if that is what it would take to defend his own. They say that God can vanquish enemies to submission and thus make wars cease against his people anywhere on the earth, verse 9. They say that God can obliterate the most lethal weapons of the enemy, like breaking bows that they become unusable, like uh, slicing a spear in two, or burning down chariots in fire. You see, there is no stratagem or weapons that God can't defeat. Whether the distress comes from natural disasters, verses 2 and 3, or from man-made enmity, verses 8 and 9, God got this. And therefore, verses 10 and 11, therefore all should bow to him. It is not clear whether verse 9 is addressed to the enemies of God or the people of God, or rather verse 10, when he says, be still and know that I am God. The verb be still is the verb you would use towards someone who is advancing toward you with ill intent. And you say, stop, stop or else. And you can imagine the Lord turning toward anyone who would want to harm his people and say, stop it. Else, know that whom you are dealing with. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. You have no chance to win if you try to harm my people. Throughout the centuries, however, the people of God applied the verse to themselves. On the meanings of the verb uh, translated by be still, one of the meanings is uh, not necessarily that of stopping someone in his track, 
but that of stopping a person from being agitated. We lax. <laughs> so you can imagine people being agitated. And the Lord said, we lax, child of God, and acknowledge that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will never let them win. I will be exalted in the earth. I will never see the square inch to the enemy. So we lax and acknowledge that. You see, either way, whether God is warning the enemies of his people, stop or, el or else, or whether God is exhorting his people, relax, it's me. Regardless, everyone should bow before him in acknowledgement and reverence. And that is why verse 11, which is identical to verse 7, is the refrain that the believer should keep repeating again and again and again. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. In July 2002, nine coal miners drilled by accident into an abandoned mine shaft at the Quick Creek mine, mine near Somers, Pennsylvania. The shaft was flooded. Water gushed, gushed out. The miners were, were strapped in uh, uh, an area, they went up a little bit, and the area was about three feet high and three, about 12 feet, uh, 12 feet uh, th three feet high and about 12 feet wide. They were 300 feet on the ground and 8,000 feet from the entrance. About a year earlier, on September 11, United Airlines Flight 93 had crashed only 10 miles away from that mine. The people in the area were in distress. First, a six-inch hole was dug to supply the nine miners with air. Eventually, a three-feet hole was dug and the miners were rescued. The miners testified that there was nothing they could do. They prayed and stayed there in that three feet by 12 feet pocket until they were rescued. You see, this psalm presents us a similar image for our life. Distresses of life can suck the air out of us. They can imprison us. They can shun us from light with impending death as the only certainty. In such a situation, the miners prayed. In a similar, similar situation, Luther tell his friend Philip Melanchthon, Philip, let us sing Psalm 46. What about you? <laughs> Granted that sin may nullify this promise and service may neutralize some aspects of it. But my brother and sister, all things being normal, if you are a child of God, God, by his providence, is your deliverer. God, by his presence, is your protector. God, by his intervention, is your defender. Meditate on it and personalize it. The Lord of hosts is with you. The God of Jacob is your refuge. Selah. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this psalm. Just as Luther would say, Philip, let us sing Psalm 46. May your people today internalize it. May it be for them that in the circumstances of their life, God would prove to them refuge, strength, and a rescue excellent and always available. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. We'll close this morning by singing all four stanzas of that hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
Yeah. Uh-huh. 